About 15 years ago, Jamie and I had just started dating. And it was about two months into our relationship, and it was my birthday. And Jamie had set out to, to create this amazing birthday plan for me. She decided that the day after my birthday, the 14th, it was a Sunday night, that she was going to take me up to Seattle. We were going to go to Seattle, and we were going to go to one of my favorite restaurants, Pyramid. And because it was one of my favorite places because they had these delicious nachos that I just loved to have. But we were going up this particular time because it was Sunday night football and the Seahawks were at home. They were playing against the New Orleans Saints. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with the area, this restaurant is right beside the Safeco and Quest or whatever their name is nowadays. I, they will always be Safeco and Quest to me. But if you're watching the game on the big screen, you can actually hear the crowd go nuts during the game. And so we arrived at Pyramid. We were sitting down. We had ordered our food, our nachos. <clears throat> And Jamie pulls out a gift from her purse. And so I, I open the gift and I pull out a jersey, my first Seahawks jersey, which is kind of amazing. I've been a Seahawks fan all my life. A jersey, a Seahawks jersey, and it's my favorite player, number 81, Nate Burleson. And Nate Burleson was my favorite player because, not because of how great he was, he was a decent receiver, but he was a local guy who I just fell in love with, who got to come back. He grew up in Tacoma, got to come back, play for his hometown Seahawks, and just like, just excited that child in me. I loved watching him, and here she was. She gifted me with this jersey, and I go to put it on, and I get it on, and I look at the, the package, and there's more. At the bottom of the package, underneath the jersey, there's two tickets. She had gone out. She had found uh, expensive tickets to gift me so that me and her, we could go in. I didn't have our meal, but then we were going to get to go over to Questfield and watch the Seahawks play, my favorite team. I'd never been to the new stadium before. And not only did we get to watch my favorite team, we got to go see the Saints when Drew Brees is there. I was jacked. I was excited. Inside, I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself. I'm so uh, just ecstatic about what she has done. I'm like at a 10. And I look at Jamie and I say, oh, cool, cool. I'm at 10 inside. My response is like a two. It's like uh, just over a well, you kind of slap me in the face. And that's how Jamie took it. She's like, doesn't show it, but she's panicking inside. She's like, oh no, did I mess up? Did I do something wrong? Does he not like it? Whatever it is she's feeling, we're not on the same page. I'm super jacked and she's worried that she messed up. And in receiving this gift, it reveals uh, something about both of us. It reveals how amazing my future wife is, that she's generous, she's thoughtful, she's caring. She listens to me and knows what I like enough that she would go out and sacrifice her finances and time to do something amazing. And in that moment, it reveals in me some big immaturity. The first is that... I don't know how to receive gifts in a gracious way. I don't know how to properly express gratitude. But beyond that, it reveals that I struggle to properly communicate my emotions and feelings in a healthy way. This gift reveals so much about both of our maturity. And today, we're going to be looking at Paul's reaction to the gift he receives from the church in Philippi and what it shows about his maturity and the maturity of the church in Philippi. So today, we're going to be wrapping up our series uh, in Philippians. We're going to be looking at the final 14 verses, and we're going to look at what Paul has to say about contentment and generosity. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Philippians 4. We'll be starting in verse 10, Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And Paul starts out this passage 
And he, he makes a statement that kind of always catches me off guard because at first read, it seems like this backhanded compliment. Hey guys, I'm rejoicing in the gift, but it's taken you a really long time to get here and clearly you don't care for me. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm better by myself. But Paul's not writing this way to give a backhanded compliment. That's not Paul's style. Paul is writing in this kind of a weird roundabout way because he's setting up an answer to two misconceptions that are occurring. And he's going to address these misconceptions, these misunderstandings. And in we're going to see what he has to say about mature believers. The first misconception that he has is in this idea that the church in Philippi didn't care for him, at least for a period of time. That's not true at all. And, and what he's going to show in addressing this misconception is mature believers are gracious. Then that mature believers are gracious in a particular thing. They're gracious in how they receive love. See, Paul says that after that first statement, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. He addresses the misconception right away. He says, it's not that you actually didn't care. It's not that you lost concern. You just didn't have the opportunity to, 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 to care for me in the way you desired. You've given me this gift now after a long period of time, and it doesn't mean that you didn't care during that time. It, it just means you didn't have the ability to do so. And from that, we can learn from Paul how to respond when we are in need or when we receive gifts and we receive those things in a way that we maybe didn't desire. That too often, I've experienced personally that people, that they desire to be cared and loved in a very specific way. And if somebody doesn't meet that very specific way, they're left angry or hurt or disappointed that Paul is calling us to be gracious and reasonable. It's what Paul, or excuse me, Ed was reading and teaching about last week. Paul talks about being reasonable. This is it. The church in Philippi didn't give him a gift in a timely manner, and he doesn't freak out and say, well, you didn't care about me. He recognizes during that time that they absolutely cared for him. They still loved him. The love never disappeared. They just couldn't express it in the way that they desired or maybe in the, the preference that Paul had. We have to allow other people to love us in the way that they are capable. That God has created us all in a different way, given us different gifts, given us different busyness in life, seasons of life. And when we receive a gift and it doesn't match up to our specific desires, it doesn't mean that somebody didn't love or care. We need to have a heart of graciousness in receiving love. I just wanted to give a quick example. If you were to come after, up to me after service and say, hey, Drew, um, I could use some help tonight. I have, I don't know, a, a, a light switch. And the light switch doesn't work, which is a particular problem right now because it gets dark at like 3 p.m., it means that you are going to have a, a, a dark household that night. And if you've got kids, that can create a serious problem. But I would say if you ask me today, that's, I can't help you. I would love to help you, but I can't because it's my daughter's birthday and I have a prior commitment. And maybe I can help you tomorrow. But it doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean I don't love you. And you'd say, oh yeah, that makes sense. But what I've seen too often is that's not how we live. We would, too often we would say, well, that Drew just doesn't care. He doesn't care that I'm in the dark. That we can't meet a desire or need in a specific timeline or a specific way doesn't mean we don't care. Paul's gonna go on and he's gonna address all right, the second misconception. And the prior thing wasn't really the thrust of his argument or passage. This is. He's getting at the second misconception that he is in need and that he is in need, particularly in need of money. And he's attacking this, this patron culture of Rome at the time, that there would be a, a person or a group of people with a, an amount of wealth and they would hire somebody and they would pay them to perform services. And Paul says, I'm not in this for the money. I'm not owned by the church in Philippi. And I don't, because he doesn't live in need. He lives in contentedness. And so in addressing this misconception, what he's saying is that mature believers are contented. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need. If I, I have learned in whatever situation, I am to be content. 
Paul gets right after it. He says, I have learned to be content. And when I'm saying content, he's talking about this idea of living satisfied, living fulfilled, regardless of the situation in life. It's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a mindset. That's what he's talking about is mindset, not just an emotion, but a mindset that is focused on the truths of God versus the truths of the situation. And this contentedness is something that we all have to learn. Paul learned it. And we all have to learn it because contentedness is not normal for people in sinful, fallen, broken world. That we in society push us away. We view contentedness is a dirty word. That we, 21st century Western world, we are the farthest thing from contentedness. We are living this consumer society where we always have to have more and purchase more and consume more and desire more, reach for more, be better. All things have to be more, more, more. And it's contrary to the idea of contentedness. Contentedness says that I'm fulfilled, I'm satisfied in any situation. I don't need more because my needs are already provided by an all-powerful God. And Paul was living in a culture too that was always looking for the next best thing for something more. And he was saying, I don't need that. I live a life of contentedness. I live a life that is satisfied in my God. And I see how this, like, this, this contentedness, when you live it out, it says something to the outside world. This is why we're content, because contentedness allows us to live on mission fully. It allows us to not get distracted by the negatives in life. And I've seen this play out, and you can tell where someone places their faith when you start to live in a way that is contented. I've shared before, um, that Jamie and I, some of the difficulties in our lives, I've shared about my cousin who, who, who passed away at an early age through the cancer. And when I say cousin, I mean one of my best friends. And it was crushing and hurtful to me. Or when Jamie and I went through the IVF process and we had a beautiful daughter, but then had multiple, multiple embryos miscarry. And when I would share with somebody, I could tell by my sharing of my response how they, how they had faith and what they believed in. Because when I would share that with a fellow Christ follower, I would say, hey, you know, I'm going through this difficult time. I'm sad. I'm hurt. I, I, I'm disappointed. Sometimes I'm a little angry. But in the end, it's going to be okay. I'm hurt, but I'm not injured. And when I share that with the Christ follower, they could understand this idea of contentedness. They could understand, oh yeah, of course, you're, you're placing your trust in God. But when I would share that same exact thing with a non-believer, their minds would be blown. They're like, what do you mean everything's going to be okay? Your best friend just died. What do you mean you're going to be okay? You just spent all this money to have one kid when you wanted a bunch. How can you be okay? How can you have faith in a God who has let you down? But it said something to them, my contentedness, my belief that everything would be okay, not because things were going to go right, they clearly hadn't, but because my God was going to be with me. And it's, it, it is our witness, one of our witnesses to a fallen world, this contentedness. God, or excuse me, Paul talked about being gospel partners. This is one of the ways that we can do that. We can be and live contented. And Paul's going to go on. He's going to just expand on this idea. He says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And he's just going to kind of repeat himself multiple times. He's going to go into this idea that, that he can live both in the highs and the lows of life with a mind state that is content. And he addresses these lows of life. And Paul, right, Paul has lived a life of extreme lows. He knows fully, he has learned fully how to live content. And he's exhibited time and time again. While he's writing this letter, he's in prison. He believes that he's facing his imminent death. 
He's been in prison before. He's been beaten to the point of dying, or excuse me, almost dying multiple times. He's been chased out of town. He's been hunted down. He's lost everything he worked for at the beginning of his life. When he was Saul, he was the next big thing in Jewish scholars, and yet he's knocked off his podium. He's humbled by God. He's blinded. He has to like fall at the feet of the people he's, he's persecuting to help him. Paul knows low, low living. And through it all, what he's learned is how to remain content, that despite whatever the world, whatever people can throw on it, he can remain content and focus not on the situation, but on God. But what I find interesting is Paul goes and he talks about the highs of life and being content in the highs of life, in which I would often look at as like, oh, Paul's just being dramatic in his writing, but he's actually revealing something that I think we often miss. That contentedness is necessary, not just in the, the, the dark, the low times, but the good times as well. That difficulties in life exist whether we are in need or whether we have an abundance. And through it all, we have to maintain this mindset of contentedness. And philosophers and theologians, they've been looking at this through all of history. They've they pointed out time and again how this is true. I just think to one of my favorite philosophers and wordsmiths of the 90s, one of my favorite people, Biggie Smalls. He said it best, mo money, mo problems. That just because you have a lot of things doesn't mean problems of life go away. They still exist. They just change. When you're in need, you're worried about meeting like the lowest possible things you're worried about. How am I going to have shelter? How am I going to have food? And when you're at the opposite of stream, you're not worried about that. Now you're just worried about how am I going to hold on to my power or fame or wealth? How can I trust people in relationships? Are they there for me? Or are they there for my money? Problems will always exist, whether we have a lot or whether we have nothing. And through it all, we have to remain contented. And that is what Paul has learned, that he is not focused on the circumstances, but focused on God. Something I also noticed about it is when we're living in an abundance, often we are focused fully on that abundance and we find happiness or, or not what we would call joy, which is fake joy. And what it is, is we, our happiness depends on something or someone that is temporary. And when that something or someone that is temporary disappears, we lose our happiness because happiness and contentedness are not the same thing. Happiness is birthed out of the temporary. Contentedness is birthed out of an eternal God. And then he finishes this passage. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's one of the most famous, one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. And it also happens to be one of the most misused and abused verses as well. That I've seen this, this verse be used to justify a belief in God that doesn't exist. That's just not true. And it stems out of this idea, I can do all things. And, and what happens is people will take this and they twist it to mean, I can accomplish whatever I want through him who strengthens me. That whatever I desire in my heart, God's going to make happen because I want it, no matter how much it points to him or not. And what it does is, is it creates this, this vending machine guide where we deposit faith and out of it we get whatever it is we desire, money, fame, on and on. And it's not what this verse promises. It's not how God works. God is not a genie where we get to make our wish for things and then he just grants it to us because we wanted it. He's never made that promise. That's not the power of this verse. When I was a, when I was a, 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 a kid, I've shared this, a little bit of this before. My biggest passion and desire in life was to play professional hockey. I wanted that more than anything. I loved hockey. It was my first first passion, first time I would feel free in life. But here's the deal. I wasn't going to play professional hockey, right? I, and I need to be clear because I think oftentimes I'm not full, people don't fully understand why it wasn't going to work. I loved hockey, but I loved a particular aspect of hockey. I loved the physicality of hockey. 
I love being in the corners fighting for pucks. I love being in front of the net, pushing and shoving with defenders. I loved hitting people. And there was a part of me that even enjoyed being hit. That's what I loved about hockey. You could be physical in a way you couldn't be anywhere else in the world. And I wanted that to carry that into a pro career. I wanted to play this position. It's not actually a position. It's a style called power forward in which you are constantly physical. But here's the problem. I graduated high school at this height, 5'10", weighing 130 pounds with six or more concussions. I wasn't going to be a power forward. Power forwards are guys who are like 6'2", 200 pounds. My body was not made to to have that kind of punishment. And if I believe this, this statement to be that I could accomplish, I could become a professional hockey player simply because I wanted to and God was going to make it happen, it would lead to me having massive problems with God. It would lead to a failed relationship with him because he didn't give me what I wanted. And too often I've seen people live out that mindset. God is just supposed to give me what they want, whatever I desire. It's, it's, it's along with this prosperity gospel if I follow God, he's going to make me rich and wealthy. And if he doesn't do that, it means either I lack faith or he's powerless and he doesn't keep his promises. This isn't the point of this verse. It's not, it doesn't work with the context of what he's talking about. What Paul is saying when he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, is that I can get through all things through him who strengthens me. I can accomplish God's plans, not my own plans or desires, but God's plans through him who strengthens me. It's about perseverance. It's about remaining contented when things are good or bad. It's about trusting in the power of God when he gives you something and you say, I can't do this, but you can. And I trust in your power, God. That's the power of this statement. And we, we twist it and misuse it because we start focusing on this I part of what I want to do and what I can, can accomplish instead of this him part, the God part. That's the focus of it, the power of God, not the desires that we have. And my question as I read this is how? How can I live contented? How can I do all things through him who strengthens me? And it makes a really catchy verse. It makes a great like Instagram post. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But there's so much more that Paul's pointing to. He's getting at the idea that yes, God through the Holy Spirit, he strengthens us. He gives us the supernatural divine strength that allows us to, to persevere and accomplish things that we could never dream of. But there's more going on. Paul's able to do this, to live contented, not just because the supernatural strength that he has, but because of the mindset that he carries. That he has shifted his focus, not on the things of this world, but on the promises and the truths of God. And he abides in them. He meditates on them. He focuses on them day after day, moment after moment. And he's been revealing these things to us this entire time we've been going through Philippians. He's been talking about these truths that he knows. He's been sharing them with them and telling about how they are shaping his life, how he is living contented and on mission. And so what I did is I went back and I looked through this, this book of Philippians and I pulled out multiple times in which we see how Paul has shaped his mindset and thinking to, to put his focus on God. And these, when we adopt these same ideas, when we don't just know them, but believe them, and by believe, I mean live them out, we too can live like Paul is talking. Philippians 1.21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That Paul doesn't care what happens to him because either way he wins. If he stays alive, he gets to continue on mission. He gets to continue sharing the gospel. He gets to continue living out the calling that Christ has in his life. And if he dies, who cares? He gets to go to a heaven and have eternal life with his creator and savior. That's how he stays contented. Verse, or chapter 129, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, that his suffering, particularly his suffering and persecution, persecution, was a gracious gift from God. Because in it, he was united in Christ's suffering. 
he had deeper relationship with God because of the experience, the suffering he was experiencing. He got to advance the gospel in the suffering. He was excited by it. He understood the value of it. And so he could remain contented. Verse two, or chapter 2, 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That as he was going through these experiences and God was trying to bring out the righteousness of Christ in him, he was seeing that God didn't abandon him, that he was there the whole time with him, that he was giving the mindset, the willpower, the ability to grow and mature in Christ. And it was pleasurable to God. And he joined in that pleasure. That's how he remained contented. Chapter 215, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. He understood his identity in Christ. He wasn't focused on who he, had, who he was, the sinful man that he was. Instead, he saw him as God saw him, blameless, innocent, children of God, lights in the world. He believed fully in who God had transformed him into. And in that, he could remain contented. Verse chapter 3, 13 through 14. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul's mindset was forward focused along with Christ. He, had, he knew the truths of what had happened in the past. He didn't forget about them or act like they didn't happen. But he, he took his focus off of them, his successes and failures, and instead was focused on where God was taking him, taking him on mission to spread the gospel. That's why he remained contented. Chapter 3, 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That Paul had eternal hope and perspective that even after he died, things were going to be good. He was going to be resurrected in the glorious body and spend eternity with his king, his savior, Jesus Christ, and with all of the saints. He wasn't focused on the difficulties of the day. He was focused on the hope of tomorrow. In ch chapter 4, 7, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And later he says, he talks about the God of peace, that the God of peace will give us his peace and will guard our hearts and minds. In that he found contentment. Paul had put his trust and belief fully in the truths of God. And it allowed him to live in a mindset of contentedness. It allowed him to stay on mission. It allowed him to share the joy and peace that he had with others. If you want to know how to live contentedness, part of it is adopting this mindset and fully believing it in all aspects of your life. There's one last thing I wanted to touch on with contentment. And it's particularly for uh, our teenagers or young adults in the room that apathy is not contentment. And I say that because I lived it out for my teenage years. The defining characteristic of myself was apathy. I just didn't care. And the problem is that too often we look at apathy and we look at consentment and say they're the same thing because often they present themselves in a very same manner. But they're not the same. And they don't come from or lead to the same place. Contentment is based fully in God, the hope and promises of God. And it leads us to live out a life of mission. It leads us to righteousness. It leads us to transforming the lives of people around us. While apathy is rooted in this, 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 this failure, this giving up. I don't care because nothing matters. It's nihilism and it's self-defeat and it's destruction. And it leads to destruction. It leads to broken relationships and broken dreams and lacks of passion and, and self-defeat and on and on and on. They're not the same. And my biggest concern is that often, because I did it myself, is we convince ourselves that <laughs> I'm not apathetic, I'm content. We cannot pretend we are content when we're actually living out this idea that nothing matters and so I'm not even going to try. 
Paul never acted like that. He only said the circumstances don't matter in how I live because I'm always straining forward with God. He never talked about giving up. Apathy and contentment are not the same. Paul's going to, now he's going to continue. He's going to go on to uh, the second half of his, his final part of this, this, this book. And he's going to go in now. He's going to start talking about the maturity that he sees in the church in Philippi. He goes on to say, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul recognizes the gift that they've given him. And in it, he says that mature believers are generous, but they're generous in a particular way because often I think we, we have a misunderstanding of generosity. See, Paul, he talks about this gift actually in another book. He talks about it in 2 Corinthians 8. And we, we don't really know much about the gift in, in, as what exactly what was given, but we understand the mindset and the situation in which they gave it from. He's writing about the churches in Macedonia, but particularly he's writing about the church in Philippi when he says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So he's writing about the church of Philippi. They've given him this gift, which is most likely some amount of money. They don't know how much or, or exactly but Paul says they did it while they were in suffering. They were going through persecution. And while they were going for persecution, they saw the need of Paul and they gave not out of their abundance what they didn't need, but they gave out of what they did need. They gave more than they probably had any right to give. But this overflowing of love from God moved them to provide for Paul. And he saw the generosity that they had. See, mature believers are generous, not in their abundance, but in their poverty. When I was a teenager, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. When I was a teenager, I went to this restaurant in Seattle called, uh, I believe it's Bupa de Beppo. It's this Italian restaurant and they serve this uh, family style, which means just massive portions you're supposed to share with multiple people. And after the meal was done, uh, we just had a ton of food left over. So we packed it up in a doggy bag and we headed out the restaurant. And as we were walking out, we passed a gentleman sitting on the sidewalk. And he was clearly homeless. He was emaciated. He was hungry. He was hurting. And it, he asked for some food. And, and I did like I would often do. I walked by and said, oh, he doesn't actually want food. He just probably wants drug money. I dismissed him outright. But as I'm walking, something struck me. You know what? If he wants food, I have food. Why don't I give it to him? And so I turn around and hand this man this food and he is just excited. He's beaming. He's so grateful. He may have wanted drugs, but he also really wanted some food. And I turn around and I, and I like pat myself on the back. I had just done something so generous. I was so proud of myself. And I'll be a little bit honest. I was there with an old girlfriend. I was like trying to show off a little bit. Man, I probably look really good right now. But after, I, as I was, as I'd grown up and looked back at that, that, I wasn't particularly generous. I gave out of abundance. I literally had more food than I know what to do with. There was probably two or three extra meals in this bag. I was going to go home and the reality was I'd eat it one more time and then probably toss the rest. I had more than I needed and I gave it away. And it, it's good, but that's how we're supposed to act. That's what we're supposed to do. It's, it, it should be our natural state that when we have an abundance, we don't hoard it and, and squander it, that we, we see it as a gift from God and we, 
that we give it to other people, that we're willing to give in our abundance. That should be our natural movement of our heart in action. Generosity is something more than that. It's when we don't have and yet we still give because we are focused on God that will provide for us versus what's in front of us. That's what the church in Philippi was doing. They didn't have extra that they gave to Paul and well, we're still fine. No, they said, we don't have much, but here, Paul, you can have it because we know that God is going to provide for us. That's generosity. And Paul is blown away by it. He loves it. And it's not that he loves it just because he's received this gift, although he's grateful for it. It's more than that. He sees that generosity is evidence of how God is transforming them. He sees the fruit of the Spirit growing in them, that this is an example of love, kindness, goodness. God is transforming them, and it's leading them to love other people. It's leading them to love Paul. He's so excited by it, and he keeps going on. He keeps pouring on the praise. It's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. He goes back to the Old Testament law when they would offer a sacrifice. They wouldn't take their worst calf or or lamb. They would take the best that they have and they would sacrifice it to God and he would be pleased with the aroma of it. And that's what he's seeing there. You guys didn't give the the, the dead sheep in the corner that was, or the the dying sheep that was going to go to waste anyways. You gave the best that you had and God is pleased with it because we love God often by by how we love others. They were generous. They were loving. And it comes out of this. Pastor Jason, he shared with me as we're discussing this, this idea that often, People's generosity is reflection of how they view the generosity of God. That when we believe God is withholding, we are withholding. When we believe God is giving us his all, we are willing to extend our all to other people. Paul's getting it right here. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. They knew that God's provision was always going to be evident and they trusted in that. And because of that, they were willing to give what they didn't really have to give. And Paul's going to close out his letter. He's got just a little bit left. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He closes out. He just, he gives his, his goodbye to the church in Philippi. In it, though, we see one last thing. Paul's talking about the impact that he's had. He talks about Caesar's household, greet them. Pagans who had given their life to Christ because of the contentedness that he had lived, the generosity, the sacrifice that he was willing, all that he's been talking about in the book of Philippians have led people to be transformed, to give their life to Christ. That's why we are to be contented. That's why we are to be generous. That's why we are to be gracious and reasonable and on and on. He continues to talk about mission. He has lived out the mission. And because he has followed God, people's lives are transformed. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. Thanks for joining us on this this journey through the book of Philippians. I hope it was as beneficial to you listening as it was for me studying and teaching and the rest of the teaching team. I'm going to pass it off to the campus pastors. I love you. Thanks for sticking around. I have a couple questions I'd like to ask just in, in responding to today's message. The first is how can you live a more content lifestyle? What have you seen in Paul? What have you, the truths that he's talked about, what one of those can you put your focus on? Where do you need to align your your viewpoint of the world with God and his truths so that you can live a more contented life, a life that has more impact because of your mindset? The second question I have is, how can you become a more generous person? We talk about the blessed rhythms, uh, begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve, share. And on a lot of those is being generous with our time and resources. That is, we live a people, as a people on mission, we have to have a heart that embodies generosity. So where practically can you live more generously in a way that points not to yourself, but to the power, the transformative power of Christ? I want to pray for you guys. Lord, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you that you are God who is faithful and powerful, who we can put our, our focus and trust in. That truly through you, we can do all things, that we can persevere, that we can remain content, that we can live out your plans and your will, not because of us, but because of you. Help us to fully live and believe that. Help us to live on mission to transform the lives of the people around us. Help us to become more mature in you, Lord. Not just for ourselves, but for others. We love you. Amen. Thank you guys so much.